Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. Well, I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, also your host. And this is the show where we talk about raising private money without asking for money. Well, my guest today knows all about that. First of all, he's the head of the finance management team in his funding team uh, with uh, over 10 years of experience in real estate development and investment across all kinds of diverse asset classes. He supervises his firm's capital generation, their fund and investor relations strategy. Now, my guest expertise lies in the following. First of all, he knows how to strategic plan. We're going to dive into that. He knows about financial structuring. He knows how to port to how to analyze a portfolio and overall strategy implementation. What does this mean to you? How do you get high rates of return safely and securely? Well, my guest strong focus contributes to our continued success and drives their mission to maximize returns for people like you, their valued investor. In just a moment, you're going to meet my special guest, Daniel Angel Mejia, right after this. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Well, hello, Daniel, and welcome to the show. Hey, Jay, how are you? Thanks for having me. I am doing fantastic. How are things in Atlanta, Georgia today? Doing uh, doing great sunny day, starting to feel the, the fall season coming in. <laughs> Awesome. Well, you know, this is the Raising Private Money show. And so we always start out with our guests talking about how it is our guests have gone about raising private money. What are lessons you've learned about how not to do it? What's the best way to raise private money for your real estate deals? And what I've discovered, Daniel, is most people who have raised a lot of private money, and I see in the questionnaire where you have raised over $20 million dollars, in your career in private money. Bear in mind, we've got a lot of listeners here to the show that haven't even raised any private money yet. Right. And so I've discovered that typically with all of our guests, there is a story. There is something that happened in your career in real estate that triggered you to go raise private money. Tell us the story. How did your journey of raising private money begin? Of course, Jay, and thanks for uh, bringing that up. Um, I think the very short answer to that is, uh, in our in our case, was scale. Uh, but it all started um, when when I started uh, flipping homes, single family homes, with with my own equity. Um, you know, and as I had a corporate job, so this was more like a side gig, as they say. Uh, always wanted to to learn about the local market and uh, the local um, activities within the single family world. And, you know, one house brought another one and two and three and until I ran out of my own equity. But uh, the business seemed to be going pretty well. And the as you mentioned, the need of going out and raising some equity um, came in. At the time, it was more a friends and family approach. Uh, but at the end of the day, it was uh, to, I guess, keep supporting that initial thesis uh, and uh, proving that concept of how that flipping uh, house business um, started uh, with, with some equity from third parties. So you were using your own equity. You were using your own um, leverage, your own investment capital. <laughs> Was there a stage in your investment journey to where you went to a traditional bank to borrow money and for some reason you didn't, and then you moved over to private money or were the commercial banks ever involved in your journey? Okay. Uh, yeah. And thanks for bringing that up. Obviously. Yeah. Uh, I guess thanks to my 
corporate career, in my experience, uh, I had been structuring larger deals and other investment funds as you know part of my job uh, back in Colombia when I used to work for a couple of uh, investment uh, funds. So I knew how to stack a deal, if you know per se. Um, so in that in that regard, uh, even at, in my early stages, I I did go to uh, local banks who clearly and quickly said not interested. And then uh, fast enough, I um, got into the private money for, you know, for the loan portion of each one of, of these deals, even at early stages uh, to try to, I guess, make efficient those structures, even in, in that single family world. Uh, so it was pretty early on when I, when I started using uh, private, private, pri private money as uh, commercial loans. So when you started raising private money, what is a lesson or some lessons that you've learned uh, over the years? What are some of your favorite ways to raise the private money and how to go about it? Yeah, of course. I, I think um, there's I would break that into two spaces like a, you know, the, the, the debt or the loan portion is, um, as, as we say, now at apex you know that that's our, our our main partners our lender um that's a little bit easier to to make work just because they're used to it and as long as you have a proper underwriting it'll usually flow pretty well the equity portion is where where it's a little bit more tricky and a little bit more challenging at, at least in our experience and based on what we've um you know shared with other colleagues in the industry but one of the main things is just making sure you have a proper underwriting, stay true to your numbers. Um, and then second, I think it's just making sure that um, you can build that track record as you go. So as you have been going down your journey of raising private money for your different projects, um, what's a lesson you've learned as to how not to raise it? What's a mistake you've made on uh, like, you know, I shouldn't do that again. Um, getting too excited with the deal, uh, and, and just, uh, stretching the numbers, uh, you know, too much, uh, you know, even if you're talking to experienced or not experienced institutionals or, you know, individuals, uh, once the numbers are too good to be true, uh, that's not a safe route. Absolutely. Well, you know, one thing that we talk about here on the show all the time is how we go about raising private money is we really don't ever ask for any money. We don't sell, we don't chase, we don't beg, we don't try to talk anybody anything. We actually don't pitch deals. And how we go about doing it is by educating. We put on what I call my private money teacher hat and we teach people. I've got 47 individuals that are investing in our deals now. And we put on our teacher hat and we teach people what private money is all about before we even get into any deals. You know, desperation has got a smell. I've discovered over the years, Daniel, the worst time to be uh, looking to raise money is when you need it for a particular project and you're running out of time and you got a deadline. Would you agree to that? Absolutely. That's absolutely right. <laughs> so, so how do you mitigate that? I think in our case, it's, it's very similar. Um, we've, we've been transitioning from a more, you know, friends and family kind of like environment towards a little bit more family office and institutional world where conversations and approaches are different. Obviously going at initial stages, just going to friends and family is a lot easier. Conversation is just, you know, pretty straightforward. As long as you're, you know, you've, you've been doing well and you have some track record, it's quite easy to, to you know, I guess, to, to raise that kind of equity. Once you start getting into more, um, I guess, in, institutional investors or even not so close to you or your close circle, it's a lot more important to rely on the numbers and facts. Uh, and as you mentioned, we've, we've also started to educate, share our story, share our experiences, whether they're good, bad, ugly, uh, whatever it is, just... Uh, you know, stay humble and stay transparent uh, as, as every deal and every experience comes and be open enough to share, you know, with, with anyone that's interested in. 
Well, and you make an important point there. And that is, you know, when I'm hearing somebody talk about their business, if I don't hear any of the ugly stories, then I'm really questioning, are they really telling me the whole story and are they telling the truth? Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, especially in this in this industry. Um, I, I, I've been involved in other kinds of industries, but this one's definitely the one I've spent most of my uh, career. And uh, it's definitely an industry where a lot of things happen, good, bad, ugly. Uh, a lot of things that experience will allow you to anticipate or at least be prepared for. But, you know, as you mentioned, like if, if there's a story where there's no where there's no negatives, then it's probably not a, not a true story. Exactly. So you've raised a lot of private money. Uh, you've moved primarily from the single family to the multifamily space. Uh, and you mentioned family offices, uh, moving on to family offices from, say, individual friends and family. Uh, just to make sure, tell our audience, what is a family office and where do you find them? Hmm. The, the second question uh, is the hardest, I think, uh, where to find them. is it, You know, there's a lot of net, networking involved in this business, at least in our experience. Uh, in our case, uh, both my business partner and myself, we were originally born and raised in, in Colombia. So we're both foreigners in the States and they're starting, you know, to build our career and our experience and track record in the States. So it's obviously a little bit harder because there's no close uh, community starting off. It's something you need to build from scratch. At least it's been our experience. Um, speaking about family offices, uh, it's, you know, it's usually either uh a equity or wealth from a family, as its name says, managed by either a professional group or someone from the family. And they're usually uh, looking for certain types of investments, usually in, in I guess, um, trying to diversify whatever their uh, portfolio is. Um, in some instances, there's uh, groups that manage multiple uh I guess, um, equities for multiple families. So that, that those are called or named multifamily offices. And in our experience, it's been more like uh, attending events or just networking uh, and, and, and building those relationships from scratch once again, just because it's, it's usually a lot of um, relationship driven and trust in, into these relationships until they're, they, they feel comfortable enough to pull the trigger in a, in a deal with you. Absolutely. Well, um, you have got a fund and the name of your company is apex investments, uh, dot us. In fact, I want to go ahead and put that URL out to everybody. Uh, www.apex, a P E X in apex investments dot us. So tell us about apex investments dot us. What's that all about? Of course, and, and thanks, Dave, for bringing that up and uh, for sharing our, our website. Um, I guess a Apex Today is a platform uh, where we structure acquisitions, multifamily acquisitions. We're mainly focused in multifamily. We're based in Atlanta. Uh, and so far, all our investments have been here uh, in Metro Atlanta. We like to be, you know, uh, boots on the ground, close to the asset. Uh, you know, wherever we go, we, we, we like to understand, know the market and, and, and be as close as possible to, to the asset. Um, and what we're, you know, looking for is for uh, multifamily properties that have some kind of value add opportunity. Value add meaning anything where you can uh, do some kind of renovation, whether it is interior or exterior or both, in order to increase rents and improve cash flow. That's essentially what we're solving for in order to obtain uh, returns and force that appreciation of the asset. We're usually holding for five years, five to seven years is what we structure for. And, um, the, you know, we, we raise equity from either retail investors or institutionals in order to drive along these um, execution or, or, or I guess business plans for, for the multifamilies. Mm, we come from the single family space. That's where we started, uh, as I mentioned before, early on uh, doing street flipping. 
and then putting all our experience from past experiences, corporate experiences, and our single family experience uh, to work and transition from that single family space into the multifamily world. Uh, and that's where we are right now. Excellent. Well, I was going to ask you if um, you were doing any new bills right now, or if it's all finding a good deal on a uh, perhaps somewhat distressed um, multifamily apartment complex and turning it around, getting writs up, doing a value add, making it nicer. Um, is that right? Right. And, and that's a really good question. Um, we do have some new construction, but it's mainly on the single family space. Pretty much what we bring from that single family experience, we do some of that, but our bread and butter and, and, and main uh, focus is acquiring existing property in the multifamily space and as you mentioned to execute a value add program where we usually acquire uh 80s vintage so anything built in the 80s and sooner or more recent uh where we see there's um some distress in rents and the opportunity to via renovations improve that uh, component and um professionalized uh, management in order to improve uh, performance. That makes a lot of sense. So really, uh, am I understanding correctly that Apex Investments is a platform where an individual or individuals can invest in your fund and they can be a totally passive investor without having to go out there and actually do the work, but can just be a passive investor and get good returns, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think that's one of the uh, best characteristics of our of our company and our platform. I know there's a lot of uh, folks doing similar um, approaches that, that, you know, like us. Um, it's always good. Um, but that's kind of like the main thing. If, if someone's looking for passive investing because they're either busy on their, you know, nine to five or, or they're, you know, past that and they, they don't want to focus on the day to day operation of a real estate and just delegate that on a professional, that's that's pretty much our job. So what would you say Apex Investments um, unique proposition is? In other words, uh, what is it about your fund that might get an investor interested over and beyond, say, somebody else's fund? Of course. And that's that's uh, that's very important. Um, I think there's a few a few important traits there one <clears throat> being we're vertically integrated uh so even at early stages we've managed to have everything except property management in-house so sourcing deals underwriting capital markets uh, asset management and project management when i say project management specifically is like the construction itself we have our own uh project management team and, and uh, renovation team uh so we have a lot more control of what we're doing we are uh operating uh and, and acquiring in our own city in our own town so we're close to the asset we're not out of state managers which we found being very important uh especially when things don't go as planned uh and obviously today's market is one of those where where you really need to be really specific on management. Hey, I Daniel, think, I was going to ask, do things ever go as planned? <laughs> That's, uh, it, you know, we, we laugh and it sounds like a joke, but it but it's not it's not a joke. Obviously, we plan based on our experience and what we feel and think it's going to happen. But you need to be prepared for for reality. It's uh, it's, it's usually close to what you you know, what you uh, plan. But um uh, but if it's going exactly as planned, I think I think it's I would get more worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, and in my space, we talk about Murphy and I know you know who yeah. Murphy is and Murphy has his cousins and his relatives show up as well. <laughs> but, you know, in our single family house deals, Murphy always shows up. But that brings up a good point based on your um, underwriting and your criteria on how you buy and how you do the numbers, we keep it super conservative to allow for Murphy, the unexpected to show up. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I think that's, uh, you know, understanding Murphy is not only him, but he's, he's got a pretty big family. 
uh, I think that's that's pretty important. Just just making sure you're you're conservative. You're not too conservative so that you can actually do deals, but but just making sure you're not getting you know ahead of yourself and, and understanding you know the, the market. Um, for example, right now, like whoever whoever underwrites, at least that's our opinion. Whoever underwrites, you know, uh, high rent growth even on primary markets, you know, it's going to be tough for the next, you know, probably year or so. Uh, so just just keeping it keeping it true and not and not stretching the numbers too much. That's always going to keep uh, your sleep. Yeah, for sure. So when someone is investing uh, passively in apexinvestments.us, typically how long would they be looking to invest? Yeah, of course. So, so right now uh, we're in the multifamily space. We're still doing it uh, deal by deal. Uh, we haven't officially launched a fund for multifamily. That's something we used to do in, in single family. Uh, so it, for multifamily, we're uh, structuring a five to seven uh, year hold usually. All right. That makes sense. And do your investors have the ability uh, or the option to use not only just liquid investment capital, but can they also invest uh, retirement funds if they have moved those over to say a self-directed IRA company? Yes, absolutely. That's, that's allowed and perfectly, uh, you know, used. we have a, a bunch of investors who use it that way. Uh, whoever has it in, has their retirement funds in a uh, self-directed IRA, uh, you know, it's, it's perfectly fine. Sure. What's your minimum investment for the passive investor? A hundred thousand is what we usually have. Okay. I was going to ask you, and so that sort of starts the conversation. How would you describe your ideal client or what your average client looks like that is investing with you? Right. Um, you know, like we, we found to have like some kind of avatar and it's usually that, uh, you know, very busy professional, successful, um, uh, and, and in our world, a credit investor, uh, as you know, uh, whoever has a net worth more than a million dollars is what, what usually the threshold kind of like dictates. Uh, but it's usually someone who wants to have some kind of exposure, even someone or a family that wants to have some kind of exposure in real estate, uh, but doesn't have the time or the, or, or is not willing to, to deal with a day-to-day -day operation of, of such. Yeah, that makes sense. Where would you say Apex Investments and your company is headed and what's your crystal ball say about the real estate market over the next year or two? <laughs> the crystal ball, I think it's, uh, you know, nobody's had it. And I think this is the toughest time to try to have it. But, uh, but you know, we, we stay bullish on the market. Uh, I think we're on an, an, a, a pretty good asset class, given it's residential. You know, the residential gaps there, it'll be there for quite a while. Uh, even with all these deliveries that we're having in the southeast, uh, there's a lot of demand. There's a lot of, uh, you know, new residents moving in into the southeast in general. Um, so like these past 12 to 18 months have been a little bit rougher just because there's that dislocation between seller's expectations and what what actually uh, buyers are able to to make numbers work given higher interest rates. But, you know, we, we believe in the next 12 months, it's something that should start correcting and, and we should have a pretty interesting, uh, another probably ride for, for another few years. Gotcha. All right. Are you ready for our lightning round of questions, Daniel? <laughs> Of course. <laughs> of course you are. So here we go. You're going to know the answers to these. First lightning round question. If you could be known for just one thing, what would Daniel be known for? Uh, being passionate and result driven. Passionate and result driven. Love it. Um, what personal characteristic do you have that you would say has been pivotal to your success? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a problem solver and, uh, and persistent. Got it. And we, we um, found that to be pretty, pretty interesting along the way. Cause you, and, and you mentioned it, you, you need to be ready to pivot in this industry. 
Absolutely. Um, are you a reader? Do you enjoy reading books? I don't mean fiction. I, do. I mean nonfiction. I, I, I do. Yeah. All right. Well, if you could only choose one book that had the biggest impact on your life, what is it? Uh, the most recent would be uh, Who Not How. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Dr. Benjamin Hardy. Yes, sir. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I like his new book uh, that he just came out with a few months ago. Um, so here, uh, let's do something really fun, uh, Daniel. So I got a stack of cards here, right? So this is sort of like playing cards. I won't do a card trick on you. But anyway, <laughs> you just tell me you just tell me when to stop. You tell me when to stop. And whenever you say stop, stop. The question, oh, my land, you're fast. So we'll hold <laughs> up the question. So here it is. If you could only take one CD or one audio for a cross country road trip, which would you choose? Oh, um, just a song or any audio CD audio. Uh, all right. I'll, I'll make it American. So it's not, it's not too Latin American, but uh, you know what? I, I enjoy chicken fried. <laughs> chicken fried. I don't even know what chicken fried is. No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have my cell phone with me. I'll, <laughs> I'll share that with you later. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll have to check out chicken fried. And then if you can only repeat one quote, what one quote would you live by? Um. You know, it's not it's not a, a well-known quote, but I keep repeating it. It's just trust yourself, trust your gut. Listen to yourself. Absolutely. Well, Daniel, you have been an entertaining and very knowledgeable guest. I appreciate you coming on, and I'm going to give you the final words. Jay, thank you so much for, for having me. It's been a pleasure to meet you and to share with your audience too. Thanks for everyone uh, for listening. And uh, if you guys are interested in learning more about Apex or anything that we can help on regarding uh, multifamily, please uh, visit our website, www.apexinvestments.us or just feel free to reach out um, either my, in my LinkedIn or my email, dangel at apexinvestments.us. Awesome. And in the show notes, we'll have all these links uh, for your contact information as well, Daniel. There you have it, my friend, another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, your host here on the show. And be sure and subscribe and ring that bell if you're watching on YouTube. If you happen to be listening on iTunes or Spotify, be sure and follow. Here's to taking your business to the next level. And we look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of raising private money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's J C O N N E R.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.